Hello and welcome to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast series. My name is Jonathan Brown. Shepherd Walwyn is a campaigning book publisher based in London, England. Our purpose is to uncover and promote new ideas to society's oldest problems. And whilst our specialty is ethical economics, something Anthony Werner, our driving force for over 40 years, has pioneered, we have branched out over the years to other related areas such as the environment and the lives and works of society's change agents. These podcasts promote ideas we're convinced can actually help us build a better society for all of us. So have a listen and be sure to share with your friends if you like them, but also tell us what you think. These are debates we all need to be part of. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Hello, welcome to the podcast. My name is Jonathan Brown. My guest today is Coronation Street legend Helen Worth, the much-loved actress who has played the character of Gail Rodwell on the world's most iconic TV show since 1974. Now Helen has the second most appearances on the show after William Roach, aka Ken Barlow. Now whilst Helen tends to avoid the spotlight away from the street, we've been very lucky to get time to speak with her about her career, and most importantly for her and for Shepard Walwyn, to tell everyone about the wonderful book Munu, the most special rhino in the world, written by her long-term ecology partner Shirley Gallagher, and illustrated by the brilliant Zoe Barnish. Helen has been a committed ecologist all her life and we get into that along with her experiences on the street and working with some of the most iconic actors and actresses in the UK. Now this was a pleasure of an interview to do so I hope you like listening to it as much as I enjoyed doing it. It's absolutely lovely to um, to be talking to you and I know we're, we're going to be getting into this wonderful book. Um, oh, Mulu. Mulu. the most special rhino in the world and he is, he's He's a gorgeous rhino. In fact, it's hard to believe that he is blind, isn't it? Because have you watched the video of him? Oh, yeah. Out of his... I mean, he just seems to be able to see, doesn't he? But he doesn't. He's just been uh, helped by Brett to find his way around. And I think it's an extraordinary thing to see. It's just just so lovely on on all levels. And... um... You know, and the adversity that he's faced, and I just think it's a it's a wonderful metaphor. And I know we'll get into that in the in the book. Um, mm. But Helen, I, I just before we get into to Munu, I just wondered if you could if you could tell us how you got into um, an interest in wildlife, especially especially African wildlife as well. Yeah, well, yes, it goes back a very long way. Uh, so I didn't really know about it till later in life, but when I was a very small child too. Mm or maybe three, but possibly two, I took a ride on an elephant with my brother. And, oh, I I just fell in love with the elephant. And um, I did have a picture of it, but I lost it. And uh, I always thought about this elephant that I rode on, on a plaid um, rug, and my brother was with me. And... I suppose she, that elephant was the start of it all for me. And it, was, <laughs> it wasn't till years later, I think I was about 15 maybe more, when I looked again at the picture and realized that it wasn't a real elephant. It was a mechanical elephant, which were around at the time in parks and zoos and things. And uh, I had given that elephant my dummy uh, which um, I wouldn't give to anybody, but I gave it to the elephant and um, because it was so beautiful. And it wasn't till years later that I learned that it wasn't even a real elephant. By, but by that time, it didn't, it didn't matter. I mean, a child's imagination, it was, it was wonderful. No, I don't know I've got the picture. Yeah. I found the picture. You really? Wow, how lovely. And, it, and, and you were about two or three at that time. Is that right? If you yes. had it, yeah. A, a ride on a mechanical elephant but of course child's imagination I thought it was real and wow. I think that's where it all came from so I love that elephant I also um a few years on saw bears in a pit um in uh, Morecambe where I grew up uh in the park there and I looked down into this pit and saw these bears and I just thought it was the most awful thing I'd ever seen. The bears clearly weren't happy, they clearly weren't, you know, 
perhaps looked after as they should be. That's how it was in those days. And thank goodness we progressed from that. But see, I think children know, I, I think they understand that what's right and wrong and for uh, animals. And I think they understand cruelty to animals. And, um, you know, as, as Shirley says, they are the next generation of conservationists and we must protect them and, and help them. And because they're doing wonderful things, the young people for, for animals and for the environment. Yeah. And I guess it's that it's that felt experience as well that you had. And I know you can say that we can we can we can we can laugh about it being um, man made in a sense. But the, yeah. for the for the for the child, that emotional connection with a being that was so yeah. big and vast. And yes. um, I knew it was wrong. I just knew it was wrong. And I think when, you know, later on, when I looked at children in zoos, looking at animals in cages and in pits and one thing, or another, it was actually their parents that were saying, oh, look, look at the look at the elephant, look at the, isn't it lovely? And I'm pretty sure the children were thinking, no, it's not lovely. It's not nice. No. Um, and I certainly was. No, I think it's um, I think it's absolutely right. And and when you look at the, you know, your work since then. So when what was your first experiences of of helping animals? Then? I worked with Shirley uh, about 30 years ago and we just went on working together, doing what we could. Um, elephants, lions, um, whatever was needed. Um, and that relationship turned into a 30 year friendship. Wow. And that, that, again, that, that, those friendships seem to be a theme um, for you. All the interviews I've seen, you, you tend to, well, you, you stick with the friends for a very long time. Well, I think that's a pretty good thing to do. I think it's I think it's fabulous. And and when you look at the research into into what creates happiness and, and success in life is long term relationships and being in a being an environment where love is present and you take that love in. Um, oh. And I know that, you know, there's been challenges in your life, but I, I was I was listening to a podcast that you did with with Christopher Biggins, which were for comedy value and also insight and, and cur- comedy value and curiously insightful. Um, it's one of the best I've ever I've ever heard is that you're still friends you you had your your West End debut at 12 and you're still friends with the people that you were in in that show with yes yes I am and as indeed I said we're spending Christmas together (laughs) or we're hoping to spend Christmas in fact if we can't spend Christmas together we will be spending Christmas on Zoom I, I just hope I can work it properly yeah and and they're not in the industry anymore they've uh no no well no they're not no, right. they've left. It's a very hard industry, you know, and uh, to stay in, which is remarkable that I've managed to stay in it so long, really, being very fortunate. Well, do you know, and you, and so you start with musical theatre and then you have had this extraordinarily long career. Um, and now, you, you know, in your character and, and subsequently in you as an actress, you're one of the most loved characters and actresses in the country, I think. Well, um, I don't. I don't think it's just me, Jonathan. It's the whole of Coronation Street and oh, yeah, the, yeah. the characters. I I can't take credit for that. <laughs> it's no. it's everyone who's in the street, and especially perhaps through the pandemic when uh, we were still there, we were still going, we were still working, and hopefully reaching people in their living rooms and bringing some company to them, especially perhaps the people on their own. Well, you know, the enormity, I think growing up as a kid in the 70s and 80s and Corrie being the only thing on telly. Um, and I know, you know, now we've got such a choice of, of of soap operas or dramas or lives to connect with and and all the Australian dramas coming in in the 80s and 90s and stuff. But Corrie there, just as a, you know, just looking from, a, and, you know, I guess from my perspective as a kid, it was just so enormous. Um, and, it, and it's like you're in people's homes and it's like so... You know, Gail and well, Ken and, and Emily and Rita and, and, and gosh, Jack and Vera. Their names. You know, they're Maybe all... that's, that's why it continues, because you watch it growing up, excuse me, with your parents. And then uh, you go off and have a life. And then perhaps you come back to watch it again with your own children. And so therefore it goes on. Mm. And, and, and so you, you have this. You have a, a personal life of, of of great stability and long term friendships, and yet your character Gail <laughs> seems to seems 
<laughs> Can we say she seems to find it challenging to maintain long-term relationships? <laughs> but I don't think it's her fault, Jonathan. I really don't. I, I agree. I, I think the men she picks, you know, they're not good choices, are they? No. no. But that's no. not her fault. <laughs> no, it's not. I, I think, think they're a... needy in some way and Gail takes them on. <laughs> Usually, um for bad very, rather than good. They're impossible projects. Very difficult that no one else will take on. A bit like a bit like some of the some of the creatures that you support in real life. Right? Yeah, well, maybe they're the only ones that'll take Gail on. I mean, that's, a, that's another thought. But anyway. But uh, so, I mean, just on your on your career, Helen. Just what does it feel like to? Does it because you just you seem to tell so you you've been you've been part of of this institution for for most of your life, really, right? You were what? Uh, well, no. A career beforehand but certainly the past 47 years yeah perfect sorry i'm referring really to your professional life because you, you, yeah. you were in in curry at 17 is that right oh, no i was much older than that 74 i i went in i think gosh i could be uh, wrong yeah yeah, it was seven, yeah 74 right so as a you you extraordinary you seem very down to earth in your acting i, I heard you, you 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 described yourself as a as a working actress um, and yet you've been part of this most amazing show that's now an institution and it's, and it's woven into people's lives and has been for, for decades. Um, I just wonder how you perceive your role in that as a, a both Gail as a character, but Helen as an actress in being alongside people like, you know, the, well, just legendary characters all the way yeah. back to the, the originals, really. Well, it was pretty daunting when I joined, that, that's for sure. But um, there were only 20 of us then, uh, something like that. Now I think we're 80. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's very different and working standards are, are different and uh, it's just hugely different. It was very cosy back then. It was like a rep theatre. Uh, you just work with the same people every week and uh, made programmes. Uh, I just thought I was incredibly fortunate to get into it, even though it was my third time of trying. Well, even more so because of that. And um, I th always thought I was lucky to stay there as well. And, and I've never for one moment wanted to leave. It's just been brilliant. And so that, and that feeling that you had of it being a rep then, is that, and that was your earlier experiences in the theatre and musical theatre prepared you for that? Yes, I was in rep um, for years before I, um, and then I was on the radio rep, and then I started doing tellies. In fact, I went back to um, the BBC uh, yesterday and uh, for something, and uh, I was in that round building 50 years ago <laughs> when there was nothing else around, and it was extraordinary to walk back into it and see it, see what it's become. But it is the silver same building as it was yeah so in, in our conversation you've, you've been very clear that it's you know that it wasn't you and 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 refused any kind of credit um so I won't try to I won't try to, to to give you any more but just um just in in thinking about being a part of that of that work and the fact and also to acknowledge that I think you won scene of the year in 2019 <laughs> that was um, the Hillman story, like, wasn't yeah. it? In the in the soap stories, and it was such a, a wonderful, um, it was such a wonderful scene. But also, as well, I mean, you won your, um, you know, your, your your lifetime achievements awards. I think like a decade earlier, and yet you're still winning. You're still winning scene of the year. So you know, the risk of pointing out that you're 207 years old but look great on it <laughs> um, is that what do you do to keep going and to keep keep Gale fresh? And engaging and engaged. Well, but I, I love it. I mean, you, you can't get bored of being in um, a soap opera like Coronation Street because you're not doing the same thing every week. You're doing something different every week. And the character has to progress and change and evolve over many weeks. If you stayed the same, it would be boring. So you move along with the stories and with the people you work with and all my wonderful family that... Uh, are there now so that keeps it all fresh and it's always exciting and and how is how does your role change with that because when you look at the characters that are around you you've literally been with them since they were since they were bands as we'd say up north isn't that lovely it's yeah. just amazing Worked with them for many many years 
Um, just again, you know, I'm fortunate. I've always had the best people around me, which is a huge help. So your, your carriage went off to Thailand. Um, yes. And I was wondering if, if art was going to imitate life and she was going to disappear to a, an elephant sanctuary. But just moving on to your to your work with um, with the foundation, which, as you as you were saying, was has been a thirty year long collaboration with with Shirley, the um, mm. the the, 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 the leading force behind the, the White Lion Foundation. Mm. Um, what is it? Could you just tell us and introduce the story of and and the, well, the creature that is that has become Munu, which is such a beautiful book. Yes. Uh, well, Munu uh, arrived. Uh, well, he Brett found Munu, um, I think he really did find him walking around in circles. I, I love that centre page in the book. Oh, yes. Uh, where yeah. he can't see, so he's walking around in circles. And uh, I think that did happen. Brett found him and, of course, got in touch with Shirley, who is renowned for taking up causes. And she took up the cause of Munu and got him moved to Founders Lodge in South Africa at his Boma built where he's as you can see can now walk around obstacles and he's under 24 hour surveillance he's looked after 24 hours a day because of course he could never have survived in the wild that's the first most important thing to say he would have been killed caught by animals or poachers immediately um because he couldn't see so he was rescued and he was taken to founders lodge where he's now living a very nice life and as we speak they're trying to find um a mate for him uh because he's still a young rhino um a rare rhino and uh he will hopefully prolong the species yes and um and and, and that's one of the things when with the with the foundation's work is that is that you and Shirley and, and Brett and the team have a habit of taking on really difficult challenges. Oh, yeah, I mean, that it's it, it, Shirley sometimes. I think, oh, Shirley, I don't know about this. But she is never deterred. She, she knows what's right. She, um, her integrity towards animals is just extraordinary in it dedication and a kindness and oh I, I could go on forever but once she decides to help an animal she, and it, you know it doesn't have to be herds of animals it's as important to look after one animal as it is to look after a mass of animals they all need help um, in this world and uh, yes I mean she takes on and, and they're all so, so different, you know, a rhino, a rhino and a turtle and a snow leopard and <laughs> it just goes on. She just hears about an animal that needs help and she says, yes, we'll help him. Yeah. And she does. It's kind of like, it's almost as that, if you remember the, the A-Team um, series when, you know, if you need help and no one else can help you, then you need the, I mean, the White Lion Foundation really, don't you? In the, That's you know, Absolutely snow correct. leopards caught in a diplomatic incident. Oh, okay, well, that will be White Lion then. Um, and I know, as you, as you said, there's a, we've got a, a wonderful book coming out about about them in 2022. And I just think when when you look at them, seeing them as symbols for for ecology and protection, and our relationship mm. with with the environment, and also with mm. with the animals in it, and the rights that that they've got, and what are our obligations, you just seem to say something very powerful about that in your work with the foundation. Yeah. I, I, I think it all means hope. The fact that we care about one rhino is hope for lots of rhino. Yeah, and you know, and, and I think that I, I know there's some you know, some of the people that, you know that can say, well, why are we spending so much on one rhino? It's just that it's the research and everything that goes around the protection yes. of, of of rhinos and animals like Moon, isn't it? That's it's, that it's makes a big the difference. It's for the future. With the book, what do you hope people will get from, from reading the book? Um, well, I hope, firstly, that all age groups will read it. Um, it's because I think it is for everyone. I certainly think it's for adults to read with their children. I think um, children will be enchanted by it uh, and by 
the um, beautiful illustrations. And I, I think I'm just turning to the center page now. One of my favorite things is when Munu is walking around in circles and it says, the fireflies hung like fairy lights in the dark night, but he couldn't see them. Oh, well, you know, I mean, for children, that is just beautiful. It touches children's hearts, I think, throughout the book. And through that, I think will touch their parents' hearts as well. I don't know if we're able to show people it, um, this image. Um if we can find a way, because it is just, so, it's, it's one of the most evocative images I've ever seen, I think, in a, in a children's book. Mm. Um, so just, just a wonderful illustration. Um, An illustration by Zoe Barnish, who has done the book uh, just beautifully. Yeah, mm. and, and a wonderful, you know, yeah, a wonderful body of work for, for Shirley. And now you, you mentioned slightly earlier, and I know Shirley, when we, when we interviewed her for the, for the launch of the book, um, referring to children as the conservationist of the future. I just wondered what are you, what are the foundation's plans to do, to work on and develop oh, this further? Yeah, I mean, it, the children are important because, as I said earlier, the children understand, I think, what's right and what's wrong, and I think they will lead uh, us all into um, better conditions for 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 animals. And they've got all sorts of things going on out in South Africa, at Founders Lodge, but but also in. Um, in the in Pakistan with looking after the um, snow leopards I mean there's everything that everything's on the website you mm. know all, all they have to do all you have to do um, parents and children alike is go on the website and be and learn and be captivated by it all yeah I know we've got we'll, we'll post some links on the um, when we release uh, the the podcast just so people can get there um, as easily as possible um and it's and so it, also the book's been nominated for the people's book prize Ooh. um so how do we vote for, for well Mona? you you do you get online to the two white line foundation and it's there <laughs> as soon as you're in uh, it shows you how to vote and please do vote because it's a prestigious prize and it all helps to for the conservation of wild animals and so, uh, just a I, click it's all you have to do is click <laughs> yeah that really is all you have to do so you um the white lion foundation you deal with some of the most difficult um challenges in in a local level so just for animals or you know the, the snow leopards or munu or um all the other stuff that you've been doing for the 30 years um how do you stay positive when there can be so much negative news around with regards to the environment and our, the way we treat animals <laughs> Yeah, I know, but there's no point in being negative, is there? You just find the way through and carry on and, and be positive because things can change and things can be done and things have been done. Um, so just keep going. You know, and, there's and, good, there's a lot of good out there. Yeah. There really is. I really do think there's more good than bad and um, just have to hope for the best. Well, I just think that the inspiration I find with the with with your work and and uh, with the your support of and the work of the White Lion Foundation is that it, it really is the epitome of the of the starfish story, isn't it? Really, I don't know if you've do you know this story. Tell me, and I'll join in. So, so it was a there's a there's a story of a, there was a big storm and a, and then um, and all these starfish are washed up on the on the beach. And so a little girl comes onto the beach and she starts throwing this, put, taking the starfish back into the sea and throwing them back in. And then a man comes up behind her and says, look, he said, he said, there's thousands of starfish. He said, how on earth are you going to, you can't save them all. And the little girl looks up, looks him in the eye and says, I can make a difference to this one. Yes. And, I, and I, you know, and I, and I think that's, that can be the, the challenge that we face with the, with the, all the ecological stuff, especially right now, literally, as we're getting all the news coming out of Glasgow and the, the COP26 and, and everything else is it's not our job to save the world it's just our job to make a difference and to help yeah. to help where we can mm. and I think the White Lion Foundation is a wonderful symbol of that and and your work and your support of the the foundation is is just a great example of of helping this one. Thank you thank you very much that's a, a lovely way to put it it's a lovely story 
Well, Helen, it's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And as I said, I'm 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 due for now. I think the biggest piece of Christmas cake having actually spoken <laughs> spoken with you. How can people find out more about the charity and and how can we support the work of it? Well, uh, it's easy, really. Go to the White Lion Foundation website. It'll tell you all about it, all the uh, think wonderful uh, projects that there are. But right now, it's coming up to Christmas. So please buy Moo News book. Um, if you buy Moo News book, you enable us to carry on helping rhinos. And, and also we can vote for it. Um... Moon of the Book in the People's Book Prize as well. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, the People's Book Prize is a prestigious award and to win that again um, is to help rhinos and wildlife wherever they need it. So please vote. Brilliant. Helen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for listening. Now, just as a quick reminder, in case you needed one, you can buy Moonu, this wonderful book from the Shepherd Walwyn website and all the usual places. It will make a terrific Christmas present for young and old alike and support a very, very good cause. Thank you for listening to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast. To explore these ideas further, be sure to visit our website, www.shepherdwalwin.com and join our mailing list for news and special offers. Check out our authors and buy the books to learn more. And you can also find us on social media. Links are also on the website. And if you like the podcast, please head over to iTunes or Spotify to give us a review. It's surprisingly helpful in getting the ideas out there. So until next time, keep reading. <laughs>